American Baptist Church, we're so glad to see you. Good to see you here today on Mother's Day. Amen. Yeah, well, Ray, we all are thrilled and amazed. If you are a mother, would you please stand? Just stand right now, right where you are. Give them a big hand. <laughs> Ladies, we appreciate you. We thank you so much for being our mothers and for blessing our lives and all the special things that you do. As you exit the worship service, there's a little book for you. It's uh, originally Ordinary Moments, Extraordinary God. Uh, it's for you mothers, written especially for you. We hope that you'll pick up one. It's a devotion for women on the way out of the, out of the church. Our, our men will hand you one, and we'd love for you to have that. Thank you, mothers. God bless you. What a great day. We have a great service planned and prepared a lot with uh, you in mind. Tonight, there will be no worship service. We will not have a worship service this evening. Um, <clears throat> on the 28th, that's in two weeks, our PM service, I will be giving a report on our Uganda mission trip and look forward to sharing that with you. A lot of details. You've prayed for us and many of you asked, have asked already about that. And we'll be glad to share details with you on the 28th, the night of uh, the 28th, May the 28th. Vacation Bible School is June the 26th through the 29th. And uh, those uh, VBS sign up and preparation is underway. So mark that on your calendar, June the 26th through the 29th. June the 8th through the 11th is our youth camp. And our youth are preparing to go to the beach. Yes, and so that is, uh, they're ready to go, and excited about that. Very good, so today is the deadline for signing up. Okay. Very good. We are excited about that, uh, and we are grateful to the Lord for the opportunity to um, have you leading us in that way. So please get that done today, and youth will be eager to include you in our special summer plan for you. I know we have guests today and some of you are here with family members. If for some reason we do not have information on you or details, uh, we'd love to get that. And our ushers will give you a card. You can drop it in the offering plate when that comes by. And that way we can know a little bit more and welcome you a little better. Um, this morning, we have uh, someone who's not a guest but is a special friend, longtime member and a participant in Big Hurricane Baptist Church, Aiden Mahan. Would you come forward? Uh, as you know, Aiden is uh, soon graduating, and uh, shortly after that is going to sign in, right? Yes, sir. All right. Well, we have, uh, yeah, give him a hand. <clears throat> He'll be going into uh, uh, Marine Camp. Basic training. Basic training. Okay. And you're going to do that where? Uh, Paris Island. Okay. Paris Island. Okay. So pray for him as he goes. And uh, from you, the church has supplied a, a little military Bible. So we've inscribed it. There's a gift card here as well. And we're so proud of you. And we thank the Lord for you. And just pray that you do well. Appreciate it. You stay healthy. And that you uh, serve your country. God bless you. That's the plan. Thank you, my friend. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Stephanie. Happy birthday. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Who we got? Who we got? You must stand. All right, here we go. Let's sing it with our hearts. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you.
Good morning and happy Mother's Day. We kind of did something neat and special um, last uh, choir practice. I asked some of my mothers to pick their song, their favorite song. So it's kind of uh, mother's choice today. So if you'll please turn and stand first and turn in your hymn books or turn your hymn books and then stand to 328, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Let's sing both verses.
did just went blank. Miss Stacy picked that one out. I love that one. That's great. Let's go. Ooh, Grace alone. This was Miss. I just. Oh my. I can't tell anybody's name. Okay, Amy. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm a real mom. If I can't remember anybody's name. <laughs>
Hold back high, fly away. Oh, fly away. Oh, for real love. Fly away. When I die. Fly, 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 Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Ravel and Choir. 
That is true motherhood fashion. Uh, to forget a name, my mother often did that. She looked at her children and tried to call their name. It's really bad when you have three sisters. <laughs> she says, Paula Denise K. Ville. <laughs> she finally got to me, but we're grateful that you're here. We thank you for coming today, and as you come, bring your gifts. Mark Burridge, would you lead us in a prayer for our offering? For our mother, we just we wouldn't be here without them for all they do for us. They are a blessing to you, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you for all the blessings you bestow upon us. Lord, we just ask that you bless us often. Bless everyone here, bless everyone that gives. The Lord thank you for your son Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, workers and teachers who are going to work with our children right now. Um, I would like to let you know that among the congregation are some very brave souls, and Ashley Rammel is one of them. This morning, I asked her if she would help me with an interview about mothers, and she agreed. Stand on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate you. I think the whole church is in love with your boys, and we're grateful for that. We are glad they're gone right now, but uh, this is. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> Could you tell us what it is like to be a Christian mom? It's very rewarding, but it's also probably the most difficult thing that I've ever done. Yeah. How is it? How do you do it? Lots of prayer. Yeah, lots, lots of, of prayer. Lots of lots of prayer. Also, faith in God's plan. You know, I have to remind myself that He gave me the children I have specifically for me. Mm -hmm. That's good. And that's, a, that's such a rich blessing and promise that he has given you and so many things will come from that. So uh, I know it must be difficult with three boys. I know uh, that you have, uh, your oldest one is how old? Eight. And the youngest? Three. Three. So in that age span, you have a lot to deal with. What advice would you give moms out there who are trying to raise young children? Well, pray a lot and know that you're not alone. You know, the world is against us. It's, it's different when you're just a Christian and you don't have children. But when you have children, it's even worse because the devil uses your children against you. You know, mm -hmm. they're taught to fit into the world and you're trying to teach them to stand out. And so just have faith and know that that's what you're calling us to do is to help them stand out and to help them reach others. Amen. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Yeah. Well, that's important, and I, I wanted to get that said and done because really moms need to be, uh, they're the ones with, with the message today. They have uh, given to us this message already. They've blessed us in our lives. Uh, so many of you have Christian mothers, and you were privileged to be raised by a mom that knew the Lord, and um, that makes a difference. That makes a difference in your life. That makes a difference in what you believe about yourself and where you're going with who you are. And um, I'm grateful for those Christian moms. I, I dearly loved my own mother, and she taught us so much. From the Scriptures, there's an ideal passage to talk to us a little bit about a mother, a mother's love. And um, 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 16 to 
27. Speak to us about a mother's uh, devotion, the test of motherhood. The test of motherhood. How can you tell when one is a true mom? Would you follow with me as I read this from 1 Kings chapter 3 beginning at verse 16. Then two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, O oh my Lord, this woman and I have the same house. And I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. And then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. And we were alone. There was no one else with us in the house, only we two were in the house. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside her while your servant slept. And laid him at her breast, and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my child, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, behold, he was not the child that I had born. But the other mother said, No, the living child is mine, and the dead child is yours. The first said, No, the dead child is yours, and the living child is mine. Thus they spoke before the king. Then the king said, the one says, This is my son that is alive, and your son is dead. And the other says, No, but your son is dead, and my son is living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. So a sword was brought before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. And then the woman whose son was alive said to the king, Because her heart yearned for her son, O oh my lord, give her the living child, and by no means put him to death. But the other said, He shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. And then the king answered and said, Give the living child to the first woman. And by no means put him to death. She is the mother. You pray with me. Our Father, we're grateful for your amazing love, for the powerful music we've heard today, for the testimony and commitment of mother's love. We thank you, Lord, for this story, the reminder of not only how you've placed mothers in our lives, but how your wisdom guides us and them in life. We pray that just this scripture would now speak to us, that we would receive the blessings that you have here, the guidance and instruction that's ours. We pray for each one. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Well, Louise Shattuck was not happy with the definition that Webster gave for a mother. Webster just simply says that a mother is a female parent. And, and Ms. Shattuck says this is an understatement of all time. A mother is a walking encyclopedia and expected to know the batting average of Stan Mutual, how to tie a half hitch, and where somebody left Sunday's comics from last week. She must answer without hesitation. Questions like, where does the sun go at night? How does jet propulsion work? What are the principal exports of Thailand? And where do baby kittens come from? A mother is a master mechanic who is able to get a trouser leg out of a bicycle chain and can fix anything with duct tape and a hairpin. She is a plumber who knows that the water won't run out of the bathtub because the tissue sails off the children's boats have clogged it up. She's an electrician who can make a train run backwards without blowing a fuse. She's a practical nurse who knows how to make a splint for a bird's broken wing. She must also be able to remove splinters and loose teeth painlessly, stop an earache in the middle of the night, and cure the measles before the fourth grade picnic. Mother is a detective who finds a missing mate to every sock. And when her scissors and flashlight disappear, she can recover them long before the culprit pleads guilty. The mother is an untiring seamstress who sews on scout badges, designs tricky patches for jeans, and, places lost but and replaces lost buttons, lets down and takes up hymns repeatedly, and is able to make a pair of wings and a halo for the fourth grade play with such majesty that Nobody notices the angel's two front teeth are missing. A mother is a sage. She is wise enough to know when her son has reached the age that he would rather die than be kissed in public. 
and when her daughter's best friend has won the heart of the only boy alive. Yet she is an innocent who never ceases to wonder at the miracles of life. When the first crocus peeks through the snow and the first bluebird eggs appear in the nest. A mother is a lady in waiting who is never too busy to find a lost ball, too tired to read another story aloud, or too squeamish to bait a hook. A mother is an heiress, although she may not feel wealthy when she's trying to stretch the family budget to include braces for teeth. Also, she is rich in rewards. She is able, uh, her heart swells with pride when she realizes that her teenage child has offered to mow the neighbor's grass while they were away on vacation. Her little leaguer is willing to uh, uh, pitch with a spring finger rather than let down the teammates. She is rich in investments. As she watches her small daughter tenderly tucking her doll into bed, she hopes her child will grow up to know the happiness of being a mother. And so, Mr. Webster, this is Louise Shattuck's definition of a mom. I think when you look at this story and you draw from the wisdom of the Bible, you see so many things beginning to happen. Here is the issue re related to parents' rights. What rights do parents have? This is really an ongoing battle in our courts. It is one that is before Alabama right now. Under Alabama law, there are several situations in which a court may order the termination of parental rights for one or both of the parents. In some circumstances, a parent can relinquish parental rights. This is known as voluntary termination. In other situations, typically abandonment, abuse, or neglect, the court may order involuntary termination of parents' rights. Whether the process is voluntary or involuntary, the courts seek the best interest of the child. <clears throat> it's a big deal. In this story, we're talking about parents' rights. This is a dramatic demonstration of the wisdom of Solomon and thus the wisdom of God. When the resolution of this case uh, becomes public before uh, the people, the Hebrew people, Admiration for the young king's wisdom grew into a fame that would cross continents and not be limited at all by time. It is a typical example of oriental wisdom, concerned with the actual business of life rather than abstractions. What that means is this wisdom that God gave to Solomon was for practical resolutions of the needs of his people. This is why God gave Solomon this wisdom. Rather than um, magic answers to puzzles and uh, snafus and rhymes and riddles, which actually, it, sadly, it became in the life of Solomon. But in verse 28, it says, the people were in awe of the wisdom of the astute judgment of Solomon. His revelations came from the wisdom of God Himself. Divine justice is dispensed uh, infinitely wise from an understanding Father who looks on the heart and who knows the mind of humanity. And this is the wisdom that Solomon had. This case is not the affairs of state. Though we know Solomon was a tremendous uh, statesman and that his, uh, his kingdom, the borders of his kingdom, expanded beyond any uh, king before or after him, the previous or following monarchs. God has chosen us um, to show us his wisdom through this intimate story of a family, of humanity, particularly motherhood. And how motherhood is affected by godly wisdom. The case is opened not by lawyers, but by women, by mothers. They were prostitutes. Like a, an inferior court below this, and, and there was a court system set up much like our courts. Inferior courts could not resolve this. The case was passed along forward without resolution until it came to be untangled by the king. 
And so the first test that Solomon gives is the test for truth. They were living in the same house. Uh, it was something of a public building. Some sort of a public building may have been a home for prostitutes, a house of prostitutes. The Targum is actually a, an Aramaic paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible. And as th this story is recorded in the Targum, it says these women were innkeepers. Now, that's just because they were embarrassed by the term prostitutes. If your translation says innkeepers, that's okay. But they were prostitutes. And as prostitutes, they did not have any rights. They did not have any uh, position to be heard in a public court. And, of course, prostitution is condemned by the Scriptures, by those who live the righteous life, the teachings of the Bible. But in this present case, the harlots are seen as women who are helpless. And they have no one to guide them. No one to protect them. And so they plead their case. This special appeal is made and it goes all the way up to the king. Somewhat like the appeal of the Apostle Paul who appealed to Caesar. When it got to a point that there was no uh, movement in the case, he appealed to Caesar. It went all the way to the top like our Supreme Courts. Each mother has delivered a son. And within three days of each other there is a theft in the night when one mother uh, rolls over on her child and accidentally kills her son and so she takes her companion's child that's exactly what's happened the one cheated appeals to the public courts and to resolve the case the real mother knew which child was hers she knew this was not her child and it is pretty much the definition of a mother to know who her child is, to be able to understand which is her child, to be able to pick her child out. Uh, I watch a lot of documentaries uh, with regard to animals and that kind of stuff. I love to see the, the rock, and, uh, the islands that are covered with penguins. Have you seen this? I mean, there's like thousands of them. And they're all there, and they've all got eggs, and they're, you know, they're, those eggs are hatching, and, and something happens, and the mother has to find her chick in the middle of all of these other mothers. And she finds it, and you know, they're, they're secure, and they're together. The mom knows her babies in a field of a thousand. There, of course, is no witnesses to this case. This is easily disputed just by uh, my word against yours. And it is, it's a living child that they both want. It seems to be impossible to resolve this. And both mothers uh, wish to have the living child. Even in this profession, which is ungodly, is wrong, the mothers desire life. So there's a test of life. There's a test for life here. First is a test for truth. Solomon's trying to get to the truth. There's the, then a test for life and his strategy for unveiling the truth is decisive and shocking. It is a proposal to kill the remaining child and to have this child divided between the two mothers. <clears throat> Solomon has patiently heard the cases of both sides. He sums up the evidence and he calls for a sword. He calls for a division of the living child between the two contenders. The test of life. What will happen now? This, this is a shocking uh, test. In life, there are some shocking things that happen. There may seem to be no solution to some of the things that happen to us in life, there seems to be no resolution. And it seems that sometimes there's cruelty on the part of God to let these things happen in life, on the part of the eternal king to allow some of these things to take place. And yet, there's wisdom seen in this test. The solution comes from the endangerment of the child. And it brings the true mother's love to the surface. And as the sword is raised, 
The false mother stands on her principles as cold as a stone. She is willing to lose the child to prove herself righteous. Hear me? She's willing to lose the child to prove herself righteous. There's a test of love. Here's the big one. The sound the, the, and, and the shrewd way of deciding the parental truth of the child by cutting it in two does show divine wisdom because there is a certainty in this story and Solomon knows it. There's a certainty in this case. There's something upon which he can depend 100% and he, and he puts his uh, commitment there. The love of the real mother is a tender, certainly upon which the king realizes he can depend. The child's life is more important to the true mother than her parental rights as a mother. And so she gives the child up to save the child's life. She who knew her child, she knew this was not her child. She knew this was her child. And now she is ready to do what she must in order to preserve the life of the child. This is clearly seen before the king. Now, kids, children, we all thank God for our mothers. And one of the things that we can count on in life, however cruel life may be, however difficult life may be, we enjoy the same confidence that Solomon had in the mother. We enjoy the certainty of a mother's love. And throughout our lifetime, the child depends on this. They are confident in that and they enjoy it no matter what happens because of the mother's love. To her child, to her, the life of the child is the most important. And so, countless witnesses of, of, of mothers giving their children uh, food, giving them uh, an opportunity, giving them an education, giving them a portion is recorded in history. There's countless examples of that. You know that mothers are willing to deprive themselves for the life and the benefit of their children. Whether it's this case in the Bible or not, this is the case of our moms who know and love the Lord. The last test is a test of selfishness. We can't get past the fact that there is one mother, the false mother. This is not her attitude. The second woman carelessly rolled over on her child. His life was not protected. Again, a second time she's willing to leave the child in an unguarded state. How many unguarded children are there? In Alabama tonight, today. How many unguarded children are there in Brookwood today? She is identified as not the real mother because of her failure to protect the child. This is the attitude of the world. If I cannot have it, then you cannot have it. It exposes her as a liar. This is the timeless Picture of those who are without Christ, willing to destroy life, devalue life itself for personal gain. Life is not worth much in India, I'll just tell you that. It's just not worth much. Life is not worth much. There are abandoned children wandering the streets. Children are sold into slavery for food for the family. It happens daily. But there are abandoned children here. We have workers to prove it. We have evidence of people who work to try to give a place for an abandoned child. She who knew that the dead child was not hers has a mother's love. She who does not have a living child because she 
ended his life accidentally, tries to stand on a point of honor. She does not care for the child. Her selfishness is greater than her love for anyone, including her offspring. That's really heavy. And it breaks our heart to see that happen. Thank you so much for your testimony this morning, Ashley. Thank you, mothers, for your testimony of how a family should be raised, of how a child embraced in the love of Christ can be raised. Thank you for that. God bless you for that. May your numbers increase. But godly wisdom in this story comes from the king. He is able to help the mother protect her child. She recognizes her child. And she brings him to the king. She is confident that she, he will be saved if he can be in the presence of the true king, the true judge, the one who knows and who understands. And so the godly mother continues to do so. The godly mom today in wisdom brings her children to the king, brings her child to the righteous king of kings. She bows before him and she leads her children there to him. She is long-suffering in her willingness to do this. It doesn't happen once. It doesn't happen the first time. It is a continual process of determination and long-suffering where mothers put themselves in the position of bringing children before the king. Influence of a Christian mother in a home cannot be duplicated. She's willing to give up her happiness for the security of the child. That's an old, well-known story, and we thank God for it. Moms, if there's a mother who's not saved here today, if there's one who does not know Jesus as personal Savior, we pray for you that you would come to Christ and that you would receive Him as your Savior, that you would come to the King, that you would come to the righteous, the eternal king of kings there's nothing that you can ever do that will be better for your child than for you to come to the king and you see you can't bring your child to the king if you're not in the company of the king you, to, to drop him off at the door and just to keep going is not going to help that child like if you are personally committed and you know and walk with the king of kings you understand his wisdom it has already affected your life you have committed yourself to him. Now you bring your king. That's the order. Now you bring your child. That's the order. Now you are in a position to say, I know this is true. I know this is right. And I'm bringing you to what I believe is the right way. God will bless your life. God will bless your child. There's no greater thing you can do then come to the King of Kings. Mom, if you're not a Christian today, please give your heart to Jesus Christ. We'll help you do that. We'll pray with you. We'll bow with you before the King. We'll let you experience what the King's wisdom can do for your life. And then, then you will be in the best place. You'll be in the best possible place to motivate your child to come to faith in Jesus Christ. This is Mother's Day. I hope that each mother will be blessed and each mom knows the Lord Jesus Christ. If we can help you in any way to become a better mother, if we can help you in any way at all to guide you to the King, we want to do that. But we know that your place in the home can never be replaced. That your position is one of authority and grace that God has given you to guide your little ones into the protection of the king. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we're amazed at your love, at your patience and understanding, at your grace. We pray that as we sing our hymn of invitation now, that the doors of each heart would be opened, that there would be a response to you and a response to your message in a test for motherhood. 
May this special day, one we've reserved to recognize mom, be the day that some mom accepts you as Savior, that some mom brings her child to the King. We ask this and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation.